Thank you all for coming. Okay. Um, okay. We're so watch you all. I will tell you, I already met Joanne, and I was blown away by her. <laughs> we back outside the bar the other day for like an hour and a half, just she had it. A gardening life, everything. She's an amazing person. So I read up a little bit about her, so you'll know. Um, so listen for that. Joanne is truly an amazing woman and has quite an interesting life. She was the purser, which is the lead flight attendant, which I didn't know what the purser was, so that's why I had it. They change this term every time he is so Oh, really? Oh, okay. <laughs> She was that for 46 and a half years for Pan Am and Delta. She especially loved working on the 747s and cherished all her years of traveling. In January of 2020, right before COVID hit, she decided to retire. I'd say that was good <laughs> timing. <laughs> <I'm gonna do laughs> <it>. God. <laughs> Joanne's love of gardening was instilled in her by constant exposure to her dad and grandmother. They were both incredible horticulturists and gardeners. Her father even became the head of forestry in New York, a very prestigious position. However, when she was younger, she had absolutely zero interest in any of this whatsoever. Of course, over time, this all changed. Um, Joanne grew up in Marlboro, Mass and then went to Springfield College for French and English degree. She and her husband eventually moved to Hastings and Hudson in New York. Once they bought a home there, she began to notice that her trees, plants, and flowers needed a lot of TLC. Given this realization, she decided to brush up on her gardening knowledge and skills by enrolling in Cornell's Master Gardener program. Honestly, I had no idea what a master gardener was until now. And there's a commercial on TV now. And he says it's a master gardener. Um, it's a three to four month program where she learned once again everything she needed to know about gardening. Um, the other thing about this program, and you can fill in, it's uh, she volunteers. Like you go through the whole training, and then it's like a community service, and you help out the community with all their gardening. And it was like a 60 hour volunteer commitment. Mm -hmm. And then after you did that, then every year you would have to volunteer 20 hours, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. sure. mm -hmm. So between her flying and gardening profession, she was pretty busy. Joanne and her family also have a home near Christfield Beach. Since she was retired and spends her summers on the Cape, Last year, she decided to look for a little gardening job. <laughs> so she brought a resume over to Deacon Gardens in Ostergaard. That's right next to it, to see if they had any job openings. Once they read it, they actually hired her on the spot and offered her a six-day-a-week position. <laughs> that was really way more than she wanted, so she agreed to four days. All I can say, if you ever need her help, feel free to stop in at the nursery. She will certainly make your thumbs greener in no time. I really paid attention that day. I thought she's Well, thank you, and it's good to come be here today. Um, Sorry that the wind has halted our progress in our own gardens, but I still, I'm one of those gardeners that will not prune my hydrangeas until the bitter end. Because too many times, and I'll tell you a little bit about that, I've been caught unawares and I find that I just end up with foliage and no flowers. What's that? No, um, I'll, I'll, I'll go over that in a second because that's why I brought some of the props. But um, thank you for having me today. It's really wonderful to be here. And I think we all share enthusiasm for plants. And I can take questions at the end if you feel you have something, that, if there's something I missed or something you didn't understand. But I have a few things here that we'll discuss. But I just wanted to start off 
by, uh, I'm just going to look at my notes for a minute until I get warmed up. And then once I get warmed up, I, hope I won't have to look at them as much. But I just wanted to, um, and if I'm talking too fast, please tell me because I tend to, when I get excited about things like plants, I tend to really get a little, I talk very fast. So. But I want to say for the for serious guy, yeah. the fine art of um, God is really more than just a hobby or a little activity that uh, takes uh, up time to alleviate boredom. As gardeners who, like me, who spent years trying things and failing, which I'm not embarrassed to admit I have, uh, the art of gardening is really a relationship. And I find it's a creative outlet for all of us. I hope you'll agree. And it's also a strong reinforcement that our gardens are a microcosm of that big world out there that we call nature. So um, when we garden, we become soft part of something bigger. And um, we create something that wasn't there before, which is why I'm, I think I'm, like you, just so interested in how am I going to fill that space. Uh, but uh, Emily Dickinson, our native Emily Dickinson, talks a lot about this in her poetry. But I thought I would just give you the esoteric view at first. But when we come right down to the um, nitty gritty of gardening, there are some things that we all know. Now, some of you are going to know this. Some of you may knew it at one time. And some of you will, for the first time, might be hearing it. But um, what I want to talk to you first about is the same things kind of apply in whether you're gardening in garden beds, container gardening, window box gardening, um, vegetable gardening, or even house plants, which I will admit, my knowledge of house plants is <laughs> But Sarah and Ann, who work at Beacon, have a lot of experience. So if you ever have questions about house plants, they're very good, and they would be the people to go and seek out. Um, but what I really like about the month of May, and thank you, Lori, for inviting us to come at this time, is you have a chance to observe for most plants that are flowering now, mostly trees, I'm talking about flowering specimen trees, this is the perfect month to see them in flower and to know if you like it, if you don't like it, if it's too, um, too much for you, if you want something smaller, if you want something more vestigious, something vestigious, something that sticks more up and is more upright. So this is a perfect month because some of you have to winter. Some of us have lost plants due to the weather after these last four days. Some of you have lost branches, I'm sure. I'm amazed that these leaves are still holding on because they're so tender. But, uh, but I just wanted to mention that, that this is a good time to really observe. And whether you go to the Arnold Arboretum, let's say, and you see a lilac, which you really love, which this past Sunday was Lilac Sunday, some of you may have gone, um, you may be able to um, you know, say, oh, I really love that plant. So it's, it's better to see if the plant is a flowering plant, not, not necessarily a foliage plant, this is a good time of year. Or the fall, let's say in the case of the Japanese maple, where you might want to see what the fall color looks like, because there are a lot of cultivars available in that. But um, I just wanted to first touch on just a couple things before I get into the nitty gritty. Um, many of you, who, does everybody here garden? Does everybody have a, an idea of, yeah, okay, good. Um, because there have been some trends over the years which those of us who've been gardening have seen, and it's, it's some of them come and go, and then some of them just get back to basics, which is what we like, whether it be the, the color palette that we like, or the, the type of flower we like, or the mixture. So um, the, the, the trend of the packed English perennial border has somewhat waned. Uh, I think people who did that then liked it, enjoyed it, but the problem is there's a lot of maintenance involved in something like a, a really heavy, heavy packed perennial bed. So people might take out some of those perennials, substitute with shrubs, which are also perennial, but they don't have this constant deadheading that they might have to have in a regular perennial bed. Another trend I remember a few years ago when I was um, going through the Master Gardener program was people wanted 
white flowering gardens that they could come and look at at the end of the work day. So in other words, they'd come home after a 12 hour work day and say, I don't even see my garden or enjoy it, but somehow if they have the white flowers, the white flowers were an attraction at the end of the day and would be something that they would look forward to. And then the other, um, uh, the other approach is the plant collector approach. Now, plant collecting is one thing if you're going to the Southern Hemisphere or going to Australia or New Zealand and you're like Darwin and you're connect collecting plants. But a little too much of one thing just doesn't really give a very harmonious look to the garden. So people are getting away from that trend of having like one of everything. Uh, they're trying to do things that are more in drifts or things that are just a little bit less or a little looser. So, um, you know, having like every single bleeding heart, unless you have a collection of hydrangeas, which is another topic in itself, and I'll talk about those in a little bit. Uh, we have so many choices, and some of these choices become dizzying after a while, and we're all looking at Pinterest or Martha Stewart Living, and we're realizing, oh gosh, this is like way too many choices. So like the Benjamin Moore color charts, how do you, how do you even pick? So, um, but I want to mention the, the big thing first before we get into some of these specifics on these plants. To garden successfully, you know the basics. You know you need sun, unless you have a shade garden, and we'll talk about that. Uh, we also need, uh, you also uh, need good drainage. But the most important thing you need is good soil pH. Now, soil P, without getting into soil science 101, which you will fall asleep here if, if we start talking about that, I just wanted to mention what soil pH is because this is the soil that your plants live in are reflective of what is going on underneath the plant. And if the soil pH, which the H is a capital H and it measures hydrogen, this means that you are, you might have um, too much uh, acidity in your soil, you might, you might have too much alkalinity in your soil. And certain plants take up nutrients and, and, and thrive in better situations. For instance, I'll just point out a few things here. Everybody knows hydrangeas are more acid loving, okay? These grow better, I noticed out front when I was sitting waiting for you to finish your soup, I noticed they did a nice job up there. They put the hollies in the background as foundation plants, and then they put underneath, they put the hydrangeas. Hollies also love acid-loving soil, okay? Um, blueberries like acid-loving soil. Um, you, could, you, you also can um, know that the, uh, like, um, for instance, the, these hostas, these are, are a shade-loving plant. They're a little bit more on the neutral side. And we'll talk in just a minute about how you can adjust pH, but you need to know that when you, plump, when you um, have a hydrangea, let's say, and you want to adjust the soil for, to make them blue, because they, a lot of people love to make to see the blue ones, you would use something like aluminum sulfate, fate. but you cannot change the genetics, whether it be the height or the color of the hydrangea. For instance, that's a mountain hydrangea over there with, the, with kind of the burgundy leaves and the little broccolis. If that is genetically programmed to be pink, you are not gonna get it to be blue because it is, no, it is not gonna respond. It's the way it, it, it really is. So you really, if you're buying hydrangeas, and again, we'll talk about that, and I'm gonna give you a little plug about the um, Hydrangea Society, because we're having a festival that's coming up again this year. For those of you who uh, don't know about it, we'll talk a little bit in a minute about it. Um, but that would be a good way to go and see some hydrangeas that you maybe you're fond of, or maybe you're thinking, I want to change some things around and I want to rejuvenate some that I already have. So uh, it might be a good idea to, um, uh, to, if you have time, to go on that tour, which is July 8th until the 17th. So, when we talk about uh, some of these plants, I'm just gonna, uh, I might skip around a little bit on the handout, but it's just something that's occurring to me. You have to be careful 
when you speak of fertilizer, what the amount you're going to use, all right? You really must follow the directions on the bags or on this a, a container like this. So if it says put down a cup, don't put a cup and a half. You're not supposed to do that. Less is not more. I mean, or less is more in the case of, of fertilizer. But I'll point out a few things on some of these um, uh, fertilizers in just a few minutes, but I wanted to just point out and make that note because sometimes people say, well, okay, I'll just give it a little bit more. You're, you're, you're better to err on the side of giving less than more. And when you apply, you go around the drip line of the plant. The drip line is the outside of the leaves. And that's where you don't put it right on the road, or right in the middle, or right on top of the leaves, or anything like that. You go around the drip line, so when it's warm, you, you put it, you know, pu push it in with your little garden hoe, and then just let the water in it. And that's all you really need to do. So, uh, one other thing about fertilizer. We would never recommend fertilizing from August on. The plants are now going to begin in August. There's something internally. Their sugars are starting to wane. They're not really um, producing and, and in their growth spurt any longer. And their, their sugars and nutrients are beginning to wane. Yes. Just a quick question. So you would not fertilize them in the fall? Some people say before the winter. Well, I think in, it depends on, on the plant. Okay. I think I would not fertilize perennials because that's going to confuse them. I would not fertilize um, most plants. If you do it once in the spring, is really enough. Now, in terms of that, perennials, speaking of, of that, perennials are just require like one feed. Annuals are a little bit of a different story because they come from the, uh, the propagator or the grower so pumped up. You've seen the baskets. I mean, they look huge. They look like they're on steroids. So these annuals are, pro are programmed to need more fertilizer. So you would use um, a, a quick release fertilizer, which is something like this. The middle number in this is for blooms. You see the 30? Okay, that's going to give you blooms. The first, the first number over here is your nitrogen. This is your phosphorus and this is your potassium. So you want a number of fertilizer that's got high in the middle. And that's going to give you the blooms. If you, for instance, um, holly tone is a 434, I see. So that is really good for hydrangeas, azaleas, rhododendrons, blueberries, anything that's acid level. You would use that type of fertilizer now or right after they bloom would be fine. And then if you're not using anything like polytone for your acid loving, you could use plantone for your other plants, your perennials. But the problem with the fertilization, and this is what gets kind of confusing. We're all aware of algae bloom and what's going on in some of our kettle ponds. And a lot of this is from over fertilization, runoff from too much nitrogen. And that's what causes that problem, which if we as home gardeners cannot do that, because unfortunately, not, nothing against landscapes. They work very hard. They know, a lot of them know exactly what they're doing. They've been in business for years, but we do have a problem with people that over fertilize and, and that's where you're getting some additional problems. So be mindful of what you're doing and what fertilizer your plant really needs without just like, oh, I'm gonna fertilize everything. So in answer to your question about fertilizing the pole, a few things, but you would never fertilize, let's say a, a tree. You would never fertilize anything that is like a perennial really that's beginning to shut down. So, um, because then it's really a waste and it's, it's runoff. The plant gets mixed up because it's like, well, wait a minute, they, they, want me to, they, they want me to do something. So it's better not to do that, okay? Um, but thank you for that question, that's a good one. Now, have any of you ever done a soil pH test? You know what they are? Okay, I knew it because <laughs> I didn't know what they were either, I have to admit. So 
who said that, oh, boring, you're never going to want to know about this. But a soil pH test is really important. Now, you can do this yourself with a, a meter. Now, this, some of these gardening magazines come with a, a meter, which is a rapid test type of thing. You can put it in, and it'll show you the acidity or the alkalinity. You can also do a pH test by picking up or going online at the extension service here in at the Cape in Barnstable. They will give you, or they tell you what you need to do, and you could know if your you know what your problem is. Now the other day in the nursery, for instance, someone came in and said, "Can you tell me?" Because I they didn't bring a leaf, so I, I had to just kind of listen to what they said, and apparently they're. Rhododendrons are really getting chlorotic looking. Chlorotic means chlorosis, like, like bleached, that like bleached out. So it's probably a case of over fertilization because rhodes need just a little bit. They don't need a lot, but he said he, he dumped a lot on. So I'm thinking <laughs> that was a sign that you know, maybe he shouldn't have dumped it all on. And now his, his rhodes, either that or they're getting the leaching line is leaching from somewhere. Now, alkalinity is the sweetness, that's the pH. See, on a, you're talking um, pH on a scale of one to 14, seven being in the middle. Anything from seven down is acidic. Anything seven up is alka, alkaline. So lilacs, like alkaline. So if you want to adjust the pH for alkaline, for a lilac, you would put down something different than you would put down, you wouldn't put all the time, you put something, something that is lime. Now, um, back to the, the, the pH test. This is where you would know what is going on in your soil. And what you can do, you can either take this over to extension and they will do the test for you and tell you if you have basic soil, which for instance, vegetables, like 6.5, roses, like 6.5, hydrangeas, 5.2 to 5.5, rhodes, azaleas, kind of around in the fours to fives. So you really can determine what's going on with your plants by knowing its pH, okay? So I can't stress that enough. You can also send the sample up to UMass, and I have an address here if you want it. You can come and, and take it, or you can go on the website. And this they test for nutrients, heavy metals, toxicity. Let's say you bought something over a construction site, and you don't know what's under the ground. And all of a sudden, this happens a lot with foundation plantings because foundations generally are concrete and they can leach lime. So people will put very acidic plants in kind of this limey soil and wondering why they're not doing that. Well, that's the reason. So I can't stress enough the pH factor, but you could also um, maybe, I, I know we, I think this year we just started at Beacon selling these little kits. You can also buy a kit. And it's like a litmus test. You basically can see what, what I'm on. And that way you know what you should be putting down as far as fertilizer. Okay, so uh, enough said about that. Now, the best way to amend soil pH, aside from giving it little adjustments, is by using compost. And I bought this, bought this bag. This is what we carry with your other brands. This is the posted name. And this is a really, this is black gold in a bag. It's great. And this is what you would, if you, let's say you're planting something, you would take the backfill that comes out of the hole, you would put the plant in, you mix in a little of the compost, not that whole bag, because you don't want to make too rich of an environment, but yet you want to make enough of an environment that it gives it a little boost because there are things in that like mycorrhizae and different things that give the roots a little bit of a boost. You water it in, then you backfill or take the backfill that you pulled out of the hole and you put it back over the plant, okay? So you would never put a whole bag of this in unless it's a very big hole with, the, let's say you're planting a tree. 
Now, a tree, for instance, the first tree you would never fertilize for that tree. They don't want, they just want you to water, water, water. Other plants that are new installations, we don't recommend fertilization the first year. Okay, so again, back to the fertilization. Now, you can build your own compost pile. Do any of you do that? Yes. 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 Oh, yeah. oh, good. Okay. So, you know about the lasagna method? No. Okay. I'll tell, you. okay, I'll tell you. It's kind of an easy way to remember it. Um, the lasagna method is basically you set aside an area, obviously, and you're going to put browns and greens in. And your browns are your leaves, your dead leaves chopped up. Then you take your grass clippings, especially in the spring, high in nitrogen, and put those in. You can put banana peels in. You can put um, veggie scraps in. You never, never add oils, meat products, protein products. I wouldn't even put, like people say, well, you can put eggshells in. Unless you rinse out the eggshells, you don't do that. I don't do it. Good. You pass. <laughs> 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 Well, coffee, that used to be, it's funny, because when I first started, I was reading the same thing you, were, everybody else was reading. And they said, well, it was good for azaleas, it was great to put out, you know, to kind of increase the acidity. I think, because I'm a master gardener, unless I see the research, I wouldn't say, it, it's a bit of a, a homeopathic, or a, it, it's not, I don't think it's going to do that much. Um, if it makes you feel good, <laughs> why not? You know? But I wouldn't put anything in the um, in the compost pile because you, basically what you're doing is you're building one that's going to cook during the summer, and then hopefully by next spring it might be ready. But maybe you have two going. Do you I have just bought myself a double barreled one that's okay. okay. So she's oh, yeah, that's a serious, <laughs> serious. Yeah. Yeah. So what you do is the main thing is to keep it a little moist and aerated because you're supposed to be getting, this is supposed to be all breaking down, but never, put, if you put any animal protein in, you're gonna get rats. So do not buy any, you know, and even if you think you're, you just have to keep something maybe by your sink, you put your, your vegetable scraps, bananas are good because they have potassium in them, so put that in, and then you can, you know that you're in a, um, you know, uh, uh, you're, you're fine. Now, one thing I like to uh, remind you is that um, knowing your U.S. Department of Agriculture agricultural zone, okay? Now, this is just something to keep in the back of your mind, but basically uh, nurseries such as Beacon, and I have to say others here on the Cape, are, are very educated about what plants are gonna live in our environment and our, our climate, and this, Actually, we're in we're in a zone what they call um, the zone um, where am I going? seven. Oh, we're seven. Yeah, seven A or seven B, and six B would be in very low, like a low valley area. But I don't think we have any low valleys on the Cape, do we? I don't know of anybody. But a lot has to do with like exposure, meaning you know wind. You might have a little microclimate, and I'm going to tell you why that's important. Last year. On my first year working at Beacon, I happened to see this crepe myrtle. And I'm like, why are you carrying that? You shouldn't be carrying that. That doesn't belong in our zone. Well, crepe myrtles are really hardy as far as the Mason Dixon line. So I'm in the Washington, D.C. area. So I was a little shocked, but I thought, well, maybe Dave's ordering this. Dave is the nursery manager because of climate change. But you can put something that's um, like a crepe myrtle which is very pretty, by the way, and blooms in July. It's very nice. And you could maybe try something like this if you want to push the envelope. But you would really want to be going to a nursery where they are not ordering things from the Deep South or Florida. I mean, tropical plants, for instance, mandevillas. Does everybody like those with the mandevillas? Yeah. Very pretty. Yeah. They look great. They're um, they're really treated as annuals here. They're yeah. not, they don't come back, right? Does exactly. anybody have any luck with those coming back? Yeah. I don't, but uh, I put them in my cellar. <laughs> they don't come, they don't look good. So the mandevillas would be considered a tropical plant. So you would put that out as an annual on your patio 
and it really blooms all summer. It's beautiful. Mm -hmm. It gives you really a, a very, and keeps coming back. Another one would be hibiscus, but those are, again, very tropical um, plants. So you would not want to be buying, let's say if you have a place in Florida, you probably shouldn't be bringing plants back from there to plant up here. They right. just don't grow well up here. So you'll be using your nurseries that are local, that are, are very, um, very good about um, what they will order. Uh, and Jeff, our owner, really respond, responds to this responsible stewardship. So um, the other thing I just wanted to say about this, just a little bit of the climate change. Deanna, who's our manager of operations, I saw her bring out her little sh Chicago variety fig out of the greenhouse the other day. Now, in the past, hardly anybody would buy a fig. Now, there are turkey figs, there's the Chicago variety fig, which likes colder weather, and it's already got some buds on it. It's already, actually, it's already got a fig on it. But it was it overwintered in the greenhouse, and now she's, she's brought it out. So when I saw it, I said to her, does anybody have any prosciutto? Does anybody have any lemon wretches? Are we in Italy? So it's, it, that's another example of something that really isn't hardy to our zone. But you can, as long as you know what to do with it after it either finishes uh, flowering and fruiting, then you're in. Um, then you're okay. But I mean, some people burlap them. Some people just put them in a very warm place, and they don't look nice at all during the winter. But they're, when they come back, they're very, uh, they're, they're very enjoyable. Now, I'm going to talk a little bit. Does anybody have any questions so far? Am I going too fast? Mm -hmm. Am I talking too fast? No. <laughs> no? Okay. Um, thank you. You're so kind. Um, all right. So the contains. I brought one with me. This is one that Sarah made up. It's very simple, but this has the elements of the upright plant, the thrilla, then you've got the spilla, and you've got the filler. Okay? So you've got, remember those three things when you are putting together your containers, because most of us like to do our own based on what we're seeing, or maybe we're changing our color palette. But just keep in mind that that is kind of the look you're looking for, um, and it, it's a nice full look. Now, according to recommendations, you don't want to overfill these pots. So that's considered an azalea pot, let's just say, just the size of it. You're not supposed to cram it so much with things. And I remember last year, a woman came in, and she said, would you build me some window boxes? And I said, well, sure, you know, what would you like? So I, I listened while she explained. And she basically said, I don't want the plants, I don't want them to look finished right now. In other words, some people come in and want, or you might want, um, something that looks really packed in because Memorial Day's coming. But some people are like, I want to hold off on the gratification until the 4th of July, and I don't, so because these plants grow, and people forget that, so they'll jam them in, then they wonder why they don't look so good. Well, Part of it is they're not getting enough oxygen. There's too much, they're being, some, in some cases, not watered enough because anything that's terracotta like this is going to need a lot more water as a container than, let's say, something that's in the ground. And I wanted to talk about that now because, um, but before I, I, I go on to that, I just want Lori locked when I can. Okay, I've got a new technique for you guys. These are coffee filters, all right? Every time we go to fill up our pots, most of the time, I, I always use new soil from the year before and then I kind of recycle it. Mm -hmm. You pour, if the drainage hole is very important, right, in the pot. So you pour in the, the, your soil, your potting soil, and you don't use potting soil that's got green or blue things in it, crystal, because that's kind of, that's like, stuff that isn't really necessary. Just get a, a straight potting soil that it looks is going to be, um, that will be sufficient. So what you do is you take these coffee filters and you put these on the bottom of the pot, okay? So you're not going to lose some of the soil as you're filling up the pot. These are biodegradable, so they're going to, you know, go away. I, you can use this type, you can use this type, and it really makes it a little bit 
more of a tidy way to put your planters together. So I just wanted to mention those because I, I find that they're extremely, um, it makes it a little uh, more tidy. So as I said, the biggest failure in container planting is uh, lack of oxygen and overcrowding. So one final thing, back to the nutrients, excess nutrients uh, to plants, what overeating is to people, unhealthy, okay? So we're, I think we've gotten that established. Now, one thing I want to mention, I'm just going to take a quick glass of water while it's here. Thank you, about watering. These pots tend to really evaporate quite a bit. So you would be watering more a container or a hanging basket more than your regular uh, plant, your, your regular garden plants. So the rule of thumb is to remember to water deeply, deeply, sometimes a half an hour could be deeply, or, and then, uh, but not daily. So you shouldn't really be out there, except in some cases, but the best litmus test is, is take your finger, you stick it in the, the plant, you go to the second knuckle and feel it. And if it's still wet, you don't need to water. If it's dry, the other big test is you pick it up. If it's really, really light and feels like there's nothing there except a little soil and a few roots, you know it's dry. So then you would water, okay? Now that's a bit different than in your own garden because you're gonna be watering less frequently and uh, the window boxes apply as these containers as well. Um, I'm going to go back for a minute to um, the compost. Only, oh yes. Uh -huh. I've had this problem. I have these beautiful ceramic pots that are, you know, job lot. You've all seen that three mm -hmm. bulb group. Mm -hmm. And I keep buying miniature evergreens because I like yeah. Christmas this time to decorate them. And I try to water them, I try to take care of them, fertilize them. But next year, that plant dies on me and the roots are very dry. So right. I'm not watering enough because I'm getting enough sun. Probably it could be a little bit of both. Like we have a little a cute little plant, I'll have to tell you. It's a little citronella plant. You know we all heard of citronella, you know what that does for the mosquitoes they hate. So we have these little conical shaped ones that are great. They're only about that big. And they're great and they're kind of like a little limey green color so they really kind of pick up variations in different foliage. I have a feeling that, that they're just drying out. Drying. You know, they're drying out. And that's the biggest problem. I mean, there are pots out now, you've probably seen them in catalogs that have a watering system to them. And you can kind of hook them up with a little hose and somehow I think it goes into, I don't know if it goes, it must go into your, your maybe your irrigation system but the problem with the irrigation systems, and I'll go into that too when we talk about roses, is if you have irrigation systems, they could be your biggest enemy because they could be watering overhead, which is a very big no-no with roses because every, you should be watering the plants at the roots. So whether that be using soaker hoses, you're not supposed to stand there and go, this because you know, even if the roses tend to be disease free, you're going to get different funguses, you're going to get black spot, you're going to get all sorts of things on them, and that's why it's important that you know when before you put the plant in where your irrigation is. And I know a lot of people do have irrigation, I personally don't at my house just because I've never we're, we're not here all year, and I just thought. I don't think I really need it. Now I'm starting to look that I might really need it. Does anybody know anybody to <laughs> hire? But it's it's very difficult to maintain certain plants when you've got an irrigation system that's kind of constantly watering them when they don't really maybe need it. Okay. So talk to your um, maybe talk to your either landscape or irrigation person about it if you need to adjust your times. But um, I think in your case, back to what you said, you know, I think it might be that the roots, either that or it's become pot bound. Sometimes things come in pots like this and you, what you do is when you take it out of the pot, let's say you're gonna put it in a window box that's about this big and it's gonna be your focal point or you're gonna have one in each end. You take and you tease the roots 
out to let them, because some of them get pot bound, you tease the roots down with your cultivator, hand cultivator, and you, you just then set that in the new planting medium. Now you can put a little compost in there too. You don't have to put a lot in, but you could put a little compost in your potting soil just to give it a little, a little boost. But I think it, it's probably watering. And usually what happens is by August, people are like burned out on the annuals. Mm -hmm. They're kind of, you know, over and over and done. But if you keep and put in a little um, quick feed, this is water, you mix this in water. You put this in with your watering can as opposed to this, which is granular. And some of these, um, this one, for instance, is a this this is a time release so you would put this in early and then you would follow up with this all right that's why i brought the different kinds so you never do these both at the same time but this one is if you put this in like in may and june this should give you the release for two or three months okay and again you follow the instructions um the mulch the mulch i'm just going to mention super quick i didn't bring any with me do all of you use mulch as a way to keep moisture in and you know that? And uh, just don't try not to buy any mulch that's, um, we've seen them, uh, uh, they're, they're colored, colored mulch. Oh, it's not really good because really there are dyes in them. So, uh, and then it, for your vegetable gardens or your perennial, if there's a certain um, formula, you four inches of grass clippings, you wouldn't use anything. Um, if this is if you do your own. You wouldn't use any sort of um, grass clippings that have been treated with pesticides. Don't use that as mulch. I always don't even go in the compost or anything. Okay. Uh, perennials, you want a two to three inch depth of grass clippings, finely shredded leaves, or um, or uh, pine bark needles. Okay. Now, uh, to finish the look, you could put a little compost on. They call it chop dressing. You could use your compost. You can either get it delivered in three or five cubic yards, or you don't even have to, or you can just buy, buy the bags. Um, okay, I'm going to talk about pruning. Does anybody? Yes. Uh -huh. Before you get to that, um, I get um, six packs of okay, the so yeah, yes. yes. mm -hmm. We pull them out, yeah. and we put them in a window box. Right, right. Should they be broken apart, loosened up? Yes. I, I think so. I mean, the, they're sometimes delicate, so you'd have to, you know, you kind of tip them over and see, you know, maybe up to a newspaper or something and, and take them out of their little six packs. And some that's where you really see the plants that root bound because yeah. a lot of times you see that white yeah. because that's basically the medium that they planted them in with, from seed. Yeah. So you want to, well, you can just kind of take your, your, um, Take your, your, I didn't put my cultivator, but your cultivator and just tear it away okay. a little bit. I wouldn't take them off because you might damage the roots, but I would take some of, sometimes there's a lot on the bottom. So I, the other day I was doing something at Beacon and I just kind of pulled it away enough to make it so I could see a little bit of the roots, but I didn't want to, you know, pull it all away because then I'd be maybe taking some of the roots with me. So just kind of be more mindful. But they very much so. You're right. The annuals have a lot of that, uh huh. Because it's the the planting medium that they use to to stop. Okay. Um, are you still with me? <laughs> Is this too much? No. You get it? no? Okay. Because I get, I just I won't I won't bore you with too much more. But I did want to um, talk about pruning. Now pruning is one of the biggest questions as a master gardener. I, we used to get. Also, um, when I was on staff at Extension, they would call, people would call, I don't have any flowers in my hydrangeas. One year, my mother called me and said, Joanne, my hydrangeas won't bloom. I'm like, oh God. Well, his, in that case, it was because the tree had grown up higher, was sheltering it, the, 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 the shade, actually shading it a little bit. So, when you have that happen on a sun-loving hydrangea, you're not getting any bud set. So you really need to know what's going on around you. The same thing happened with a friend of mine who lived in Brooklyn, and she said to me, her husband said, 
to her. You're supposed to be a mass to God. How come you don't know what's going on with the heart creation? And she called me up. And she mm -hmm. me up. I said, it's because they had planted a tree. The tree that they had looked at for two years now was six feet tall. So before it was this tall. And now it's like a few years later this tall. And, and they're not getting enough sun. So that was that's one reason. But what I want to tell you, a couple of pruning rules. You can prune a plant by removing overlapping branches anytime. You can prune a plant that has um, dead branches anytime. Okay? You can prune any a, um, broken branches anytime. Because the whole thing is you want branch structure that is loose enough away from other branches that they won't rub, especially in winds like this where it can wound the plant and then open up and be a vector for disease. So keeping those three times in mind, otherwise when the plant is dormant, you can prove, now forget the hydrangeas. We're not talking hydrangeas yet. That's a whole, I'm gonna tell you about those in a minute because they are so finicky. It's amazing we can even grow them, but some people are are very young, are very onto what kind they have. So um, what I wanted to tell you though is you can prune grapevines, for instance, in February, pruning trees in the spring, early spring. Um, pardon me. And you're gonna uh, you you prune toward the out facing bud, okay? You make sure that your pruning tools, these I inherited from my dad. These are my loppers, and these are for one and one and a half inch branches. Okay, these are these are my Felcos, the best investment I ever made. I've had these for 20 years. I keep, you know, I sharpen them. These are the best ones. These are not the bypass pruners. These are the ones that you like you would be the best because these will not crush the stem as you're pruning. But these, see, they're kind of the same shape this way. What you do is you almost prune to the out facing one. You prune, um, uh, and you make sure these are properly sharpened. I clean them at the beginning. In fact, last year we had some new kids that were coming and they were learning how to prune and they didn't know the thing. They were in high school. Why would they know anything? I mean, you know, it's not like they got. <laughs> So I took them aside and said, before you touch any of these plants, you need to clean this, these tools. So you can use your, um, your antiseptic wipes, if you still have some around, most of us do. You can use, um, you know, I carry this stuff in my bag when I'm washing, you know, the, the, the soap. Just clean them off with a paper towel or the wipe. And then that way, if you are, have pruned something that has a disease on it, you're not transferring it to another plant. I mean, it's just kind of makes common sense. A lot of these things are just common sense, but you know, sometimes you need someone to mention. So um, what I do is, oh, I didn't bring my, my foldable pruning saw with me, but that's another good tool to have. Um, which is good for root pruning. Let's say you're trying to remove a plant and it's got a really tough root system. You can use your pruning saw. I saw one the other day and I said, oh, putting this on the Christmas list. Um, it's battery operated. So you don't have to go like this. You just put it down, press the button, removes the limb. So, you know, if, if any of you are into pruning tools, that's kind of a good one to know about. Um, Okay, great rule of thumb, write this down, uh, is if the f plant flowers before June, you prune it after flowering, okay? If it flowers from the middle to the end of June on, you plant or you prune it in the spring. Don't, don't except hydrangeas, oh. okay? Don't, I'm talking normal, you know, I'm talking perennials, I'm talking, you know, sh other shrubs that, you know, most of those shrubs are perennials, but that's a good rule of thumb because some people are like, when do I cut my azaleas? Can I prune them in the spring? Someone asked me that the other day. I said, oh, no, no, no. You prune those in the spring, you will cut off all those flower buds. The same with rhododendron. I mean, you would never prune a rhododendron 
in the early spring because it's full of buds. So keep that in mind when you're pruning, if you do do pruning or if you kind of get into it. June is the cutoff point. Okay, we got it? All right. Wait, can you say the beginning part again? Yeah. If it you flowers that, before June. Okay. Before, if the, if the plant flowers in spring into early June, you prune it after it flowers. Okay, if it flowers after June, you prune it in the spring because it's, it's budding out on new wood, basically, in the spring. And and you so it's it's a good rule of thumb, but don't. But hydrangeas are different, and I'm going to talk about those now. Because hydrangeas are a, an entity all unto themselves. Have any of you have ever heard Michael Durr speak? Okay, if he comes to the Cape. Sometimes he does an Overt Heritage Plantation sandwich. He's been there at some conferences and so on. He, he's excellent. This is his latest book. I am a Michael Durr group because I just think he's fantastic. He's a professor at the University of Georgia and he's done all sorts of work with, along with Mel Condon, if any of you know, Overt Heritage, who's the curator of the hydrangea gardens over there. They have propagated They've done loads of, of uh, research with them. They've grafted. So he's really pretty much the authority. And if this is the book that just came out, I think, two years ago. I think I bought it right, right before COVID or not, not that long after. Here's the story with hydrangeas. Most of us don't remember what kind we have because we throw away the plant labels. I mean, let's be practical. Um, I mean, you know, half the time you're finished with it, okay, I'm going to remember this plant, and then, no, you're not. So the problem is there are several types of hydrangeas, all right? This one is called big leaf, okay? This is a reblooming one, okay? So this one can be pruned in the, in, it'll keep going. Once you see these little, what we call broccolis, these little broccolis are kind of their, their fluid mechanism. You can prune something like this in the, um, in the spring, but this, this plant, and I'll tell you why, this over here is called a mountain hydrangea, hydrangea serrata. This is macrophylla, this is serrata. Serrata grows in the mountains of China, and their, their stems are a little bit thinner, but they have very nice branching and very floriferous. <coughs> Look at them. Oh, God bless you. These have a lot of little broccolis on them. And what's nice about these is they have this little tint at the edge of the leaves. And they're very, very attractive. And this is another nice one. That's, um, now, the reason I brought these, we have others. We're going to have more. We have Annabelle's. We have Persifolias, oak leaves, which grow to 40 feet. And you need a place to trellis them. We have paniculatas, which are low sun, and those would be, um, they're not in yet because they, they bloom later. And one of them is called vanilla strawberry, one is a little quick fire, quick fire, and these are um, very sun low. So you can plant them in sun. But most of the time, hydrangeas like what they call dapple shade. So they don't like hot midday sun. And the reason you'll know is they'll start to droop and they'll look like they need to be watered. So it's better if you can plant them near something that will give them a little afternoon of midday sun uh, shade. So in the morning, they like morning sun and they like late afternoon sun. So if you plant them in, their, in, in the right spot, you will get a very nice blooming plant. Otherwise you will get something that you'll be a slave to and be watering, watering, watering. Mm -hmm. um, the, except the paniculatus, which I don't know if any of you saw this one, carried it last year, it was on a stand. The standard is like a, a stick. It's a little bit up, upright. And it, all the foliage is on the top. Mm -hmm. It looks great on terraces or porches. And it looks, in a, it's great on a, uh, uh, like in a, you know, a big pot, if you've got a, like a cash flow, uh, those love sun. And any of the, the little quick fire, quick fire, a few others we have, uh, but we're gonna be getting a lot in, and there's a, a 
whole new introduction onto the, into the market. There's one called Little Hottie. There's one called Froggy. They're, they're, very, um, they're, they're very popular. I have a few, this is a catalog that I use, um, that I have used uh, that's out in Oregon. She's a grower, and she, I bought some hydrangeas through her, and she shipped them to me, and I have them actually at my house in Westchester. Certain plants are nice and go well underneath hydrangeas sometimes. This is a little Hoopera, which is also called Coral Bells, or Foamy Bells. And this one is um, nice because it likes a little shade. So if you plant, you underplant with something like this, or you could put some hostas. We have some blue hostas over here. Blue hostas look nice, or a stilby. A stilby look nice, and those come in different colors and different sizes, so you could, you know, kind of do a little grouping if you want, unless you just want to see, you know, just you could do look. Grasses are another way to do it, but some of the grasses, you just want to make sure a lot of them just need full sun. So these would be good under like a paniculata, but not necessarily under a, a, um, a, a serrata. Um, the pruning time is very critical on, the, on these plants. And you need to know a little bit about your situation as far as what, when I talked about microclimate earlier, you have a very, you know, winds coming through and, and your plant is more exposed. You are really subject to late spring frosts, which we get here on the Cape. And this is why, personally, I wait and it's not because I'm lazy. It's just because I'd rather not sacrifice because I one time used a landscaper who came in and decided to tidy my garden up the spring for fall, he cut back all my hydrangeas. I have serratas around the terrace. I got just foliage the following spring. I absolutely had no flowers. I was not happy with that because I had told him, please, I take care of my own. Let me do it. But he kind of either forgot or thought he knew better. But anyway, just be, be aware that macrophyllus, generally, the big leaf, like you can prune them after flowering in the in the in September. You can cut them back, or you can hold off and just lightly prune them in the spring where the flower heads were. Okay, without going deep down into the plant, because a lot of the plants, the hydrangeas, they're very they you've seen them. They there you see them now. They come a lot of the foliage is down at the the root line or at the base. So that's where you're getting your new foliage. But you should be very careful about how and when you prune. And there are fact sheets out about this in your, in your handout. I think I gave you um, a website, um, Cornell's uh, EDU's website. I think you could go on and they'll talk about you know, different types. But it's helpful if you know what kind of have. Most of the time, people have the big leaves, unless they have Annabelle's. And Annabelle's are that big white one with the big, big flower that's like that big. And those are beautiful, but they like hot shade. So you have to be a little mindful of when you're going to go for the Um, Excuse me a second while I just go back to. Oh, I know. I think we're getting a little bit. Um, let's see. Oh, I, I was going to mention a couple of um, with this uh, hydrangea serrata called Pupillo. That's the one that has the iconic blue that's so desired. In fact, it's very much like the blue of the lady right in at that table, your, your, your uh, top. And that looks nice underplanted with um, a hosta called guacamole or a Japanese forest grass. But then you might have oak leaves, which are the big ones, that attach really by little suction cups. And those like um, they're 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 bigger. The scale is bigger of the leaf, and you might like to put something like a nine bark or um, a little a cypress, a little a small cypress, which is a golden thread leaf cypress under that. And you can take uh, less tolerant, uh, less tolerant, uh, sun tolerant, um, like these um, uh, like hydrangea arborescens, which is a wooded hydrangea. You can use um, Hans halo. Those are all things that we can you know talk about if you need more specifics. But um, I already talked to you about the Hydrangea Festival. And let's see. Oh, I know. I just wanted to mention a little bit about care. Um, there is, 
This is insecticidal soap. This will help you. It's, it's an organic um, spray. This will help you with things like aphids on roses or other small um, uh, small insects. I did write down a few home remedies that you can use for um, for pests in the garden. And if any of you are interested, you can come up after, and I can we'll show you them. And you can you know uh, we can talk about them. But um, the reason, and this is what's important now is um, we maybe some of you have landscapers. Well, you don't want to be contentious with your landscaper if you're if you like them. But on the other hand, they need to know that you have standards. And let's say you want to do things a bit more on the organic side. You can say to them, I'm much more interested in the organic approach than in the um, harmful approach. So there is some, you know, that would be a diplomatic way to say it. But what I, another reason I say that is that we don't need perfection. Nature is not perfect. So if you have a couple of things that don't look beautiful, and let's say your plant isn't diseased and it's healthy otherwise, learn to develop a little tolerance for it, you know? You don't have to say, oh my gosh, that plant looks so bad because it's got a little leaf that doesn't look good. Just mm -hmm. kind of like, yeah. I think I have to worry about some bigger things in life, yeah. okay? Yeah. So I'm just mentioning that. Um, one other thing is buying, I want to encourage you to, if you are getting plants and replace them, to buy natives, look at native plants as opposed to invasives. Invasives are from a plant, what they call plants that have come from some other place. It depends on, well, for instance, um, burning bush, um, which is Euonymus salata, that is all along the highways. They've used it for erosion control and so on. That's an invasive plant. A lot of nurseries Ooh. won't sell invasives any longer. I mean, Japanese bayberry, barberry, that's very much an invasive plant. So try to keep that in mind when you're going to your nursery. Look at, like, we, I'll just say it, and not to plug for them, but they have a, 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 we have a hoop house that just has invasives. I'm sorry, it just has natives. And that's a good way to start, like the ink berries are very nice as a Jap the Japanese um, uh, Islets Granat. Those are, are a wonderful plant to plant as a foundation. Now, I'm going to talk about roses, and then I'm going to wrap up. Roses. These, you either love them or you hate them. <laughs> I personally love them when they look like this. But when there are times, they don't look like this. But we have... And so you, there are a whole new world out there of roses. We have double knockouts. You have regular knockouts. You have carpet varieties. You have David Austin English roses, which are supposedly disease resistant. You've got um, climates. You've got the miniatures for containers, which, by the way, that little serrata over here, and these two, I, I, I'll just talk about these. These are great in containers if you want to just do a big container of hydrangeas. You put other plants in with them, but they're small. They only grow that big. So that, these are the dwarfs. That's why I brought those, and I just wanted to mention those because they are kind of paired in with these. Now, um, the, the choices are endless of, in roses, but I brought these two specifically because they're both climbers. This one's called Eden. It's got a beautiful flower on it. You can see it. This one is just budding out. And this one's called Zephyrine Joanne. This is a French rose, also climbing. What do you think the difference is? This one can tolerate shade, okay? This one cannot. This one needs full sun. So roses generally need like six hours of sun a day, but if you really have a shade, a little bit of shade, you can get away with something like this one which I was really very surprised to see that we got that one in because they are, that's a really beautiful rose. And I thought, you know, most of them, like other plants, don't do well if they're not in full sun. But that one will do fine in a little shade or even, you know, dappled shade. What's that now, what is that one called? This one over here, the French rose? Yeah, Zephyrine. 
Z E P H I R I N E, Drouin, D R O U H I N, for the French speakers in the room. Did I get that right? <laughs> okay. Um, the thing about roses is they're very selfish plants. They're not good sharers, they don't play well in the sandbox with other plants. So, what you need, and they are very heavy feeders, so they're kind of better in their own little area, and that way you can manage the watering of them better, you can manage the pH, okay, 6.5 on the roses, they like that. Um, and you can manage the pruning and the, the uh, fertilization. Again, you would not want to overwater roses because they could get black spot, any other, they get a lot of diseases, they do. But if, if you're a rose, does anybody grow roses? Are they really good at roses here? Anybody? There you go, okay. Do you, do you like them? Are they worth the energy and the time? No. <laughs> <laughs> See, so you have a green thumb with roses. They probably like where they are. Growing all over the place. It's almost like it's been made though, mm -hmm. but it's not. Okay, that's and good. Then at the end of the at the end of the summer I just say, Oh my gosh, they just do the Yeah, yeah. Cut them down and you just hold them. Yeah, you do. And then yeah. the next they come back. The, the best time I find to prune roses, and but you can do it then in the fall, but the best time is when the forsythia blooms. That's the, the, the rule of thumb with roses, if you want. No, when the forsythia the forsythia is spring. Yeah, because they grow on, they grow on the wood. Now, the fun, now I'm going to wrap up, and I'm, but I have to talk to you before I wrap up about tomatoes. All right, I brought one. This one's called Mortgage Lifter. I love the names. They're great. Um, this is a, um, an heirloom from 1922. It has minimal acidity. It's great for slicing, for sauce, and for canning. Now, tomatoes need at least 18 inches of soil. So you cannot plant, a, a plant shallowly. On, on the tomatoes because they they want their roots to go down. You can take and bend one of these stems down along the surface of the ground and cover it, and it'll send up its own shoot. But you you need a minimum of 18 inches. That's why in whether you're planting them in these what they call smart pots, which are landscape fabric pots, or planting them even in the ground, you really you never put anything in the pots to interfere with the roots. So you don't use the popcorn, you don't use the pebbles, you don't use all that stuff that they've been telling us to save money on potting soil. Just put the potting soil in and put your plants in. Don't use any of the other, anything else. Now, you should get the tallest stakes you can get for these. Uh, you're going to, now these tomatoes have issues. They have issues. They get Late blight, they get early blight, late blight, Fusillium virus, they get spotted mosaic, no, Fusarium wilt, spotted mosaic virus, they get blossom end rot. If you still want to plant this plant, <laughs> even with all those things being equal, you are going to be rewarded with a ripe, beautiful, they, this, this plant has been known to produce a four pound tomato. Mm -hmm. Wow. So if you, uh, you're gonna get a beautiful tomato by late July, early August. So all I wanna say is pass the salt, please. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Now, um, if any of you have any questions, I can try to answer them for you. If I don't know the answer, because I can't know it, I'll, I'll, be, I'll look it up and get back to you. I would love for you to go back to the adding color in the shade that he sketched. Oh, that's yes. Actually, you know what? I think that's you're right. I missed that. That's right. I thought maybe you're getting sick of the same <laughs> so I skipped over that. Um, yeah, we, there are certain annuals that are very shade loving, which you wouldn't think because most annuals love sun. So the, there's fuchsia, which is great in hanging baskets. There's um, impatience, but not the New Guineas because the New Guineas love sun as well as shade. Um, the lobelia and tuberous begonias, because those like a lot of da uh, daffy blight, a stilby, uh, bleeding hogs, there are a couple of different ones, there's one called Alba, 
which is white, and then there's the traditional one, Spectabilis, which is the pink one with the beautiful shaped flowers that just kind of dangle down. It looks like a necklace that's so pretty. Um, Coral Bell, the hookara. I brought a hookara over there. Uh, Helibors, do any of you know Helibor, Legend Rose? Yeah. They're more spring-like. They're more in the spring. Their leaves look terrible, usually in the bottom when they're first coming out, but then they stand up straighter and they look better. You clean up those those bad leaves, they, which is just, just really left over from winter. And then um, we have um, the primulas, or the primroses, which are very pretty and happy looking. Now, as we get into summer, we're getting in a lot of other different um, annuals that look good in containers or baskets, so you can do your thriller spiller and fill. <laughs> So um, those are the only ones I can think of right now. Most of them are still in the spring stage. Um, soon the pansies will be out, uh, will be finished because as it gets warmer, pansies really aren't that happy. All you can save the seeds and in the fall they'll come back sometimes. Mm -hmm. But um, did you have any other questions? No, nope, no, that was no, okay. Thank you. Yeah. Well, these are the, I, I just, just I mentioned the primula, the Lenten rose, and the hoopler because they're more spring spring ephemerals. Mm -hmm. Yes. One of the plants I love is lavender. Well, me too. <laughs> and lavender, I have some that look very good over winter, but they die back. And some of them cut it down, all the way down, and something should come back. That's um, true. But the, here's the thing with lavender. I brought this. My sister gave it to me, actually, at Easter. And this is a Spanish lavender, so I just thought I'd bring it because I just think it's so pretty and it just looks great, you know, with the others. Let me, let me just give you an example. Have any of you been to the south of France to the lavender plant, to the lavender, the monastery saint -Alc? Okay, they have lavender fields from here over to Mountain Spain. I mean, beautiful, beautiful. But the worst thing with, with the, or the problem with lavender is a little bit our climate. We don't have enough um well we do in the cape a little more than let's say off cape where the, where the soils are more clay like they don't like to be wet so the, they really are that's why they actually go good with roses because these are so selfish and these are so lovely <laughs> and forgiving and they'll do a nice job around these because they don't really require much but the problem is with the lavender a lot of people mm -hmm. use them you know, it's just the climate in the Northeast, it can, it's heaving, the soil heaves, it goes back, you know, with the frost and the snow, snow load. And sometimes they just don't like freezing temperatures and that's why they grow so well in that area of France because they don't have that, you know. It's just, you know what, it's, some people bring them in, like rosemary, the same problem is with rosemary. People say, why do my rosemary come in? The rosemary, they don't like the wet feet. They, they just don't do well. So sometimes you may have, I mean, they, they're improving them all, um, and, you know, every year. So I've seen, we have a, a couple of the English lavenders and French lavenders that are really pretty. It could is, is a, a beautiful one. And, uh, but I think you, you, you have it cited properly. Is it? Yeah. Yeah. You know, sometimes maybe near, like um, a, like a, at the edge of a patio where there's enough radiant heat from the sun that will still keep it kind of nice. It's just that they don't like it, it wet. They really don't. They don't do well. It's just that kind of thing. How about anybody else? Yes. I think it's probably Maybe I should have a variety. What, what's the problem you're having? They're not, they haven't come back. They, they again like um, like a little drier, a little dry. Maybe you should just see, if, do you know which one you have? Because there are a couple of different ones. I there are, I think it's this B-I-C-O. Oh, spicata? Yeah. Or the variety spicata? Maybe do, do they need to be taken down further? Maybe. Why don't you try that first? I wouldn't okay. dig them up. I wouldn't dig them up. I just wait and see. We've had a kind of a very cool spring. I mean, yeah, it was not very indicative. And that's the other thing I read right there. They really came from the south, didn't they? Yeah. Yeah. And some of them just will adapt. And we had a lot of variety last 
street that people use as like a ground cover yeah. or, a, a, or an edger. Um, what I was trying to do. Yeah, and it just, maybe you just, you, how long do you have? I just put them in last year. Oh, okay. Yeah, try to, try to cut them back and see if you get any right down to this. Yeah, and then you can feed them a little bit. Why don't you just give them a little bit? There's a yeah, yeah. I just wanted to make you this has been. Oh, yeah.